Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham and this is Biochemistry One. Our goal in this segment is to take the first important step toward mastery of what is called protein secondary structure. Let me remind you for a moment of what that is. So we looked earlier at protein primary structure, the structure of amino acids that make up a protein, and we predicted that the structure of the primary sequence, the structure of amino, the sequence of amino acids would determine how the protein folds up into its mature machine, a catalyst or a molecular machine of some sort. Let me show you a slightly more sophisticated version, a slightly more realistic version of that folding uh, cartoon that you just saw. Notice that the protein folds up in small subsegments that are called secondary structures, our topic today. Then as that protein continues to fold, the secondary structures come together into a, typically a highly compact structure, which collectively is referred to as the tertiary structure of the protein. We'll come to that in the next segment. What we're concerned with today is the secondary structure, how these little local folds occur. In order to understand how they occur, it turns out that we have to take, uh, go back and look for a moment at the peptide bond. So this is a cartoon you've seen earlier uh, illustrating the chemistry, the fundamental chemistry of the formation of the peptide bond between two amino acids, linking those two amino acids in a long longer polypeptide or protein chain. Let's take that uh, peptide bond and blow it up a little bit here. And notice what this uh, uh, um, image illustrates. The peptide bond between the amino group of one protein and the carboxylic acid group of the next amino acid in the protein has an aromatic character, has a resonant structure, so that the, the carbon-nitrogen bond has a slightly double-bonded character as well. That creates a very specific chemistry around each alpha carbon. Let's look at that. So this is in fact a diagram of that. Let me orient you toward what you're look to what you're looking at here. These are th uh, at left, at right, are diagrammed the three alpha carbons from three different amino acids and the amide nitrogen and the carboxylic os oxygen of the central of those alpha carbons is illustrated at left. Let's take the ir irrelevant alpha carbons out of the picture now for a moment and notice that our direction is N to C, bottom left to top right, amino to to carboxy terminus. Notice that the these green uh, 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 card-like entities uh, illustrate the, the planar character of the uh, amide linkage. So in fact, for each amino acid in a polypeptide chain, there are only two bonds around which rotation is possible in the course of formation of secondary structure. One is the bond between the alpha carbon and its amino group. That's the phi bond that you can see here. Let me bring that nomenclature onto screen. And then the other bond is the bond between the alpha carbon and the carboxylate carbon, which is called here by convention the psi bond. And they can rotate either in one or the other direction, positively or negatively, relative to the fully extended configuration shown here. So psi rotations can be positive or negative. They're always clockwise looking outwards from the uh, uh, alpha carbon. Okay. So now the question is, why do we care about these rotations? Aren't the rotations just infinite so that they're not an issue? Turns out that they're not. At the extreme case, if we rotate the, around uh, the phi and psi bonds far enough, the uh, uh, amino acid side chains start to clash. This is an illustration of that. So the um, amino group of amino acid N plus 1 in an amino acid sequence is circled in blue here. The carboxylate carbon is circled in red. And for the hydrogen, one of the hydrogens on the amino group and the carbon on the carboxylic group, the van der Waals radii are illustrated here in gray and orange, respectively. Remember that van der Waals radii are where the electron density in the electron shell is high enough that two atoms can't approach any more closely without unacceptable levels of electrostatic repulsion. So this is as close as the atoms get. The point being that if you rotate far enough around psi and phi angles, uh, in fact, the amino, a the amino backbone, uh, polypeptide backbone groups, amino hydrogens, carboxylic, acidogen, uh, carboxylic oxygens, will collide and restrict further rotation. There's an even more important, however, constraint on rotation. Let's look at what that is in the next image. So shown here is a polypeptide sequence. Take a moment, find the alpha carbons, which are labeled in gray, C sub alpha, alpha carbons. Take a moment also and find the phi and psi angles for each of the neighboring amino acids. And again, then the card-like uh, images uh, il uh, uh, emphasize the, the planar nature of the amide bonds between each of the amino acids. Now find the R group side chains. They are the larger purple spheres. What do you notice here? The R group side chains are in what's called the transposition. 
that is, if amino acid N, our group side chain, is pointing up, amino acid N plus 1 is pointing down, amino acid N plus 2 is pointing up, and so on. That tends to be the structure, roughly, in most uh, 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 secondary structures because it takes the bulky, sometimes bulky, side groups and keeps them from colliding and interacting with one another. So this R group collision is another major restriction on steric rotation. So in fact, this is a very famous plot called the Raman Chandran plot, after the investigator who developed it, who uh, worked out what the maximum rotations in the positive or negative direction around phi and psi are uh, that are allowed without unacceptable collisions between things like the R group side chains. And you'll notice on this diagram the red regions are the, the regions of highest probability in known protein structures, and the yellow regions are a little larger because they stretch the envelope a little bit slightly energetically less favorable, but still allowed structures. And you'll notice two structures are labeled here. These are the two structures that we're going to talk about today, the beta sheet and the right-handed alpha helix. So these are the constraints on rotation around the phi and psi bonds in making secondary structures. Uh, it turns out that you can also look a little more closely, a little more subtly than this, and ask, what amino acids do you find in specific structures? either alpha helices or beta sheets, again, about which we'll talk in detail in a moment. That was done initially by Chow and Fashman, who uh, uh, compiled this list. Each of the numbers in this column are a normalized propensity for that particular amino acid to end up either in alpha helix in the middle column or beta sheet in the right-hand column. And what you'll notice is that a lot of amino acids are one or even greater than one. This is a normalized uh, probability, propensity to end up in these structures. But I want to call your attention to two amino acids in particular, glycine and proline, whose numbers are well below one. Uh, a, a approaching 50%, uh, normalized value of 0.5 in each case. These are two amino acids that are quite uncommon in orderly structures that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, the beta chain and the alpha helix. Let's look for a minute at why that is, because this is a very pervasive influence on uh, a protein secondary structure. And then we'll look at specific secondary structures, that is the alpha helix and the beta chain. So this is, in fact, a space-filling model of glycine. Remember it from our discussion of amino acid structures in primary uh, sequence. The alpha carbon is uh, indicated here. Notice that the alpha carbon has its carboxylic and, uh, and amino groups that you're familiar with. But what is its R group? What is its side chain? A mere hydrogen atom. It has no larger side chain like all the other amino acids do. What does that mean? That means that rotation around its phi, psi, and psi angles are not, not projecting a large side chain out that's going to collide with the side chain of its neighboring amino acids. So in fact, glycine has a lot more degrees of freedom uh, for rotation around its phi and psi angles than do uh, other amino acids. As a result, the entropic uh, uh, a disadvantage of being in a high, highly orderly structure for glycine is significantly higher than for other amino acids. So in fact, glycine is less likely to be in a structure like an alpha helix or a beta sheet, uh, significantly less. There's another amino acid for a very different reason that, r that is unlikely rare in alpha helix and uh, beta chain orderly secondary structures. That is proline shown here. Notice that the alpha carbon is pointed out and notice that the, the amine and carboxylic acid groups are indicated. But what do you notice about the amine group? Remember what proline is. It is the exceptional amino acid in which its amino group is actually joined in a cyclic uh, compound. It's a part of a cyclic molecule. No other amino acid is like this, you'll recall. As a result, rotation around the phi and psi bonds in this uh, molecule are much more constrained. And in fact, proline, again, tends to show up in specialized structures, not in the recurring and frequently recurring uh, orderly secondary structures like the alpha helix and beta sheet that we'll talk about today. All right, so that's the reason the Chow and Fashman and more advanced plots indicate that glycine and proline are found in unusual structures or sometimes even in unstructured regions and relatively less commonly in orderly secondary structures that we're going to talk about now like the alpha helix and the beta sheet. All right, so the rotations around the phi and psi bonds determine the, all the different structures that can possibly be made. And then the structures that actually form are then determined by some other structures within that set allowed by the maximum phi and psi angles. And let's look at what those other constraints are that tend to pull amino acid sequences, peptide sequences, into specific secondary structures. So this is perhaps the most famous of the secondary structures. This is what's called a right-handed alpha helix. Let's take a minute to get familiar with this. Let's first look... At